Thank you for having me here. And now for something completely mainstream. <laughs> in 1979, sociologist Paul D. Allison published an article entitled Experimental Parapsychology as a Rejected Science, where he analyzed the peculiar bind faced by the discipline in its quest for legitimacy. Homeopathy is likewise a rejected science and faces a similar bind. After emerging in the Germany of Beethoven and Goethe, homeopathy prospered in America in the latter half of the 19th century, only to be all but obliterated in the 20th century through a pernicious combination of politics and the ascension of modern medicine. To add insult to injury, both of our disciplines fall under the broader umbrella of inconvenient knowledge. These ideas allegedly harm the precious economic or cultural status quo. We're truly between a rock and a hard place. So we're called to a lofty goal to change our cultural status quo, both by banding together in consilience and by making ourselves relevant to the everyman uh, who cares as every marketer will tell you about little more than health, wealth, and relationships. Now homeopathy has managed to carve out a thriving worldwide niche as a healing system thanks to its ability. I'm advancing my text, it's fine, yeah, sorry. It's managed to carve out a thriving worldwide niche as a healing system thanks to its ability to achieve sometimes spectacular results. It can save lives in acute and first aid situations as it did with cholera and other epidemics in the 19th century. At the same time, it can arrest or even reverse the course of even the most inveterate chronic conditions, which is its principal appeal nowadays. Most remarkably, it can address existential concerns and allow people to live a joyful and contented life. But why should you care about homeopathy? Its clinical benefits ground its ideas in reality and underscore the importance of having one's fringe science be applicable to society. But at the same time, homeopathy retains some pre-scientific vestiges and it has failed to develop an academic branch and make itself culturally relevant. So as a result, it's become the keeper of esoteric secrets that far beyond the practical level happen to be essential ingredients in the cake of consilience that we're baking here. At least, that's my claim. It is, after all, scientifically implausible for some of the same reasons as parapsychology, such as the lack of a mechanistic explanation, its insistence on the primacy of consciousness, and its support of non-locality. So today, I'd like to share with you a few of these universally relevant insights that reveal in astonishing detail how consciousness manifests itself in the natural world. I believe that these insights constitute crucial foundational pieces in the puzzle of consilience. But first, a brief overview of homeopathy and specifically classical homeopathy. Homeopathy is based on the historically prevalent yet decidedly unmodern idea that each type of substance possesses a unique essence or energy signature or information, if you will. It can be a species of animal or plant, a type of rock, and even a source of radiation. Importantly, these essences are real. They're not humanly constructed and symbols or metaphors that reference them identify real features of the world. For example, gold really is regal. The Narcissus flower is not arbitrarily named so. Its homeopathic picture is the very embodiment of the Greek myth, and somehow whoever named the flower sensed that. Homeopathy's other premise is based on the utterly non-intuitive discovery that disease states arise from a harmful interaction between the organism and one or more of these energy patterns. In health, we flow in and out of different states. One moment, we are brave as a lion. Another moment, hardworking as iron. Not so when we're sick. Let's take an example. A woman has been depressed ever since her mother died two years ago. Her depression might correspond with the energetic signature or information signature of sodium chloride, a remedy that is useful in those who can't let go of a relationship and end up stuck in the past. Now, this state correlates in the material realm with the chemical properties of salt. For example, its use as a food preservative. It also correlates with salt's mythology, as in the biblical story of Lot's wife, who turns into a pillar of salt after gazing back at her past. Now, salt and any other substance, for that matter, can be made into a homeopathic remedy through repeated dilution and shaking in water or alcohol. This process distills its energetic potential from its matter. The remedy can then be used to heal disease by matching its signature with that of a person. This is known as the law of similars, which is the fundamental postulate of homeopathy. Let's take another example. <clears throat> that seemingly charming work colleague who ends up gossiping and backstabbing everyone in sight. 
that person might in fact be spewing forth the energy of a venomous snake. Think of the seductiveness, fear, the mistrust, the reactive violence of snakes. And through law of similars, his behavior and any other concerns he might have can be addressed with the right snake remedy. So homeopathic disease states are actually states of consciousness. We might say that this person misperceives the world as a threatening place as though he were a snake and not a human. So having established the absolute basics of homeopathy, I'd like to focus on what may be its greatest potential contribution to consilience, its answer to the big question. What are the fundamental building blocks of reality? Are they material? Are they immaterial? What is their nature? Through most of homeopathy's history, substances were investigated for their homeopathic properties without considering where they came from in nature. But over the past few decades, homeopathy has begun maturing into a systematic science while converging with chemistry and biology. And homeopaths have begun to break away from the, pre the purely empirical tradition of their past. So what they began doing was to speculate about the homeopathic properties of novel substances based on their location on the periodic table or on the tree of life. So this move has been possible because there were already well over a thousand established clinical pictures of various remedies, and these have served as anchor points to these new ideas, which in turn have been tested and refined in the clinical setting. And this evolution has been propelled by the need to expand the range of homeopathic remedies to improve clinical results. It wasn't propelled by, uh, primarily by theoretical curiosity, but nevertheless, it has immense theoretical value to us. Let's take as an example a few remedies from the nitrate family. So also known as, sorry, also known as uh, Solanaceae. So there's Datura stramonium, Etroba belladonna, and Mandragora officinarum. Um, <clears throat> Despite their differences, these remedies all address violent states and delirium with terror, sometimes even demonic visions. So eventually the idea arose that these commonalities were in fact properties of the entire botanical family rather than of the individual species. So for the first time, homeopaths began generalizing beyond immediately perceptible data. And this way of thinking has now become so well established also with plant families, biological kingdoms, meaning other plant families, other biological kingdoms in the periodic table and so forth. And thankfully, these inferences have proved to be largely correct or correct enough to serve as starting points for improving clinical results while attaining more and more comprehensive coverage of the natural world. And in the case of the periodic table, this work has revealed remarkable previously unrecognized patterns. <clears throat> so this is the homeopathic periodic table, which, which looks identical to the non-homeopathic periodic table. The overall pattern that's been discovered is that there is a correspondence between increasing atomic complexity and where in the progression of consciousness or conscious development, a person who needs a certain remedy from the periodic table is stuck. Okay, and that'll become a bit clearer in a second. So in addition to this, each column, which is known as a stage in homeopathy, so all of these are stages, 18 in total, and each uh, row, which is a series, so those um, have distinct attributes or themes. And before I keep going, I'll emphasize that these are empirically derived themes. They're not conceptual impositions of any sort. I'll begin with the stages. So broadly speaking, they describe the rise, success, and fall of any enterprise, whether a natural process or a human undertaking. There is the initiation of something, the climax, and the decline. Stage one, for example, represents spontaneous beginning and impulsivity. Stages two to nine reflect the different stages of striving toward a goal, which is finally reached in stage 10. Afterward, there is a gradual decline as the state is maintained first successfully, stage 11, and then less and less so until complete collapse in stage 17 and a sort of latency in stage 18, the noble gases, before the cycle repeats anew in the next row. The series, meanwhile, describes describe the evolution from, roughly speaking, a young to an old con consciousness. And each series is named after a representative element. So the hydrogen series has to do with coming into being, incarnating. And for example, a person who might need the remedy hydrogen feels alone in the universe, as though he's the only entity yet existing, which is quite reminiscent of the experience, if you will, of hydrogen 
let's say following the Big Bang, before other um, elements evolved. Uh, carbon series, the second one, has to do with the theme of separation from the womb, from complete attachment in lithium to complete detachment in fluorine. The silicon series has to do with the stages of formation of identity or ego development. The iron series has to do with fitting into society, to your immediate surroundings. The silver series has to do with going beyond your immediate surroundings, coming up with something new, turning away from, away from your culture, etc. cetera. Um, and that's a lot of what, what the scientific revolution has done. It's a silver series um, concept, I guess. And now there's the lanthanide series. It's right here. Yeah, it's actually tucked before the gold series. That has to do with inner mastery, inner evolution, evolution of consciousness, autonomy, thinking for yourself. What's interesting is that most of us in the room here are basically in a lanthanide state of consciousness. That's what unifies us. Okay? And past lanthanide is gold, which is outer mastery, leadership. Think again of gold and the idea that it has to do with royalty. And finally, the actinide series, which unsurprisingly has to do with creation, destruction, magic, shamanism, that sort of thing. So just to ground it in an example, let's take a man who is forever trying to defend his successful position and is barely able to maintain it. So this translates to stage 12. Now, if his primary concern is not to lose face as a conventional member of society, he might need zinc from the iron series right here. On the other hand, if his concern is not to lose his managerial position, he might need mercury from the gold series right there. So we see in the themes that emerge from the periodic table a grand pattern of coming into being and a gradual expansion of the sphere of awareness. This pattern is not a mystical revelation, but a true scientific discovery of the relationship between states of consciousness and their material co-manifestations, if you will. And it has universal applicability far beyond homeopathy. The pattern is not merely psychological, it's not merely mythological. It represents consciousness made manifest in the very flesh of nature. I'd like to move on now to the biological realm where great strides have been made in uh, uncovering patterns of consciousness in the plant kingdom. There are two plant classification systems in existence, one constructed by Michal Yakir, which is based on morphology, plant morphology, and the other by Jan Scholten, which is based on DNA analysis. And he's actually the same person who developed the periodic table system, which will become important in a second. Now, both systems agree that how evolutionarily advanced a plant is correlates with the spiritual complexity of the issue addressed by the remedy made from that plant. So the first of those systems borrows on psychological constructs, Eric Erickson's developmental stages for the rows and Jungian concepts for the columns. Broadly speaking, the more archaic plants, roughly top left, um, they address issues that are archetypally feminine, for example, lack of boundaries. Whereas more recently evolved plants, roughly here, address archetypically masculine issues such as protection of overly rigid boundaries. And this system creates a sort of periodic table of the plants, if you will, that helps in, clinic, in a clinical context, it helps to zero in on specific, the specific botanical order or family in which the correct remedy might be found. And incidentally, it maps out how consciousness manifests itself in the plant kingdom. Now, is the similarity with the chemical periodic table a coincidence? Or could it indicate a deeper relationship between the kingdoms of nature? Meanwhile, um, Jan Scholten, working with the chemical elements, took an entirely different philosophy or approach to the problem of plant classification. He realized that it made just as much sense to speak, say, of an iron series or stage 12 quality in a person who was helped by a plant remedy and not a mineral remedy. So he began tagging plant remedies with these labels and came up with the remarkably bold hypothesis that series and stages were not attributes of chemical elements but they actually represented something more universal that was applicable to the other kingdoms of nature just as well. After all, remedies from different kingdoms all address the same perennial human issues in their different permutations. So there must be some continuity, homeopathically speaking, between the kingdoms. Now, Scholten's ambition was to map the 
the plant kingdom down to the genus and species level. So two dimensions were not nearly enough because there are roughly 400,000 plant species in existence. Now he was eventually able to map out the known remedies of the plant kingdom, let's say a couple of thousand maybe, along six dimensions down to the genus level. And that's because different species within a genus generally have interchangeable homeopathic properties. And three of those dimensions turned out to be different iterations of the concept of series. Two were new. And the last one was the stage. So I won't have time to get into what those dimensions are, but just to give you a sense that there are six of them. And the two of them are the same dimensions as the periodic table. So the most remarkable thing about this system is how it unifies two domains of nature without reducing one to the other, as conventional science tends to do, but by proposing an underlying abstract structure that has never been before, before articulated. And this is truly unprecedented. So the question is at the bottom, what kind of entity are animals which haven't been mapped yet, and who are we? Even though the system is still evolving, it has already been used to solve thousands of previously unsolved cases worldwide, so we have much reason to believe that it's true. So here I am wondering aloud, has homeopathy perhaps uncovered a matrix of reality that gives rise to the different substances around us and even elsewhere in the universe? Could the different elements, chemicals, plants, animals, microorganisms, heck, even the stars or specific planets, simply be fulfillments of niches of the same basic immaterial stuff of the universe? Is there life elsewhere? And if so, does it follow this sort of matrix or a different one? Is the matrix fully populated, fully manifest uh, according to the principle of plenitude, whether here or, again, somewhere else in the universe? These are all intriguing questions that deserve to be worked on together. I'm, of course, aware that the idea of a matrix has been proposed in various metaphysical systems throughout history, but homeopathy offers the most concrete evidence to date of the reality of such a matrix, as well as the most concrete specification of its structure. So in the time I have remaining, I'd like to discuss a couple other facets of homeopathy that demonstrate convergence with other disciplines. The first has to do with the question of, of what is a disease state? So we mentioned that a disease state corresponds with the energetic state of some substance in the universe. But this makes no sense from a materialistic framework. Well, I would like to suggest that it makes lots of sense if we incorporate a morphic field theory. So just to, for example, just to explain it a bit more, um, how can we talk about sodium chloride disease for the previous example, except in the sense of having a, an issue with salt metabolism? Or how can the venomous work colleague be, have like a Bushmaster snake disease in the US, thousands of miles from South America where this uh, particular snake lives? So my suggestion is that the mysterious energy that's captured in homeopathic uh, remedies can be understood as the substances field, which is the non-human morphic field, and then it can interact with the human morphic field. And disease can be understood as the static interpenetration of the two fields, meaning that they get stuck together rather than flowing freely through each other as in health. So healing can be understood as the untangling of this interpenetration. And because morphic fields extend boundlessly through space and time, there is no issue with the need for physical proximity of substance and disease state. So here we have a sketch of an elegant theory of disease, perfectly in line with morphic field theory, and at the same time supported by a colossal amount of clinical evidence. And just to emphasize that if homeopathy clearly supports panpsychism, I think it definitely supports strong panpsychism, -psych meaning that not just living creatures, but all entities possess some degree of consciousness. And I'd like to speak more generally now, not about homeopathy, but about consilience from a philosophical perspective. So the whole enterprise of consilience is premised on the possibility of a gradual convergence toward a single truth. Yet philosophers of science since Kant have been divided as to whether we can even transition from knowledge of phenomena, reality for us, to noumena, reality as such. And those who say that we can, they tend to ignore that our limited consciousness may come in the way. Those who say that we can't view consciousness as a stumbling block to the attainment of true knowledge. Now, is there a more satisfying solution that brings in consciousness as a positive force? Um, a historical note, Solomon Maimon was one of Kant's most important yet lesser known critics. He's been called the last great philosopher yet to be discovered. 
And incidentally, he was also a pioneering parapsychology researcher, which may have influenced his philosophical views. Maimon's main contribution was to incorporate Kant's insight into a realist framework by observing that even if we accept that the thing in itself is unreachable, we can still approach it asymptotically as a limit. Quote, metaphysics is not the study of something apart from experience, but rather merely of the limits of experience itself, unquote. Maimon was clearly inspired by calculus, and he considered our attempt to grasp reality as an act that brings together, brings unity to the manifold of reality by relating discontinuous bits of matter into one form in our consciousness. So this act of relating is forever incomplete, so we cannot attain complete knowledge, but we can converge toward it. And that's, I think, the importance for, for, uh, for our purposes. So personally, I like Maimon's idea because it's kind of like what homeopathy does. When you dilute remedies, you get transition from matter to spirit. But I have a hunch that this philosophy might offer an ideal framework for a theory of consilience. I'd like to close with an image, a proposition. Parapsychology, with its rigorous experimental tradition and theoretical richness, is a powerful propulsion system. Homeopathy, with its proven practical relevance to humanity, is a most valuable payload. Now, the problem of consciousness, which is presumably at the core of any theory of consilience, is really hard. It truly is rocket science. And I really feel strongly that it's only by working together as sister disciplines that we can finally beat gravity and lift off and make true progress in our common quest. Thank you. So you can download a handout with a whole bunch of extra information and my contact information, et cetera. You can write this down. I only take two questions. That's it. Um, I want to say that I, I have no particular animus against homeopathy. I'm perfectly happy to use homeopathic remedies if I've found that they work for me, which some of them do. But the main criticism that I see from outside in attacks on homeopathy is that uh, people keep citing references all over the place that homeopathy performs no better than the placebo effect in controlled clinical trials. So I'm wondering if you have a, a response to that outside broadly published accusation. Well, you haven't seen the evidence. <laughs> so in the handout, there's a link to a list of over a thousand articles that relate to homeopathy in different ways. It's simply not true. It's the same, the exact same situation what I mentioned about rejected science, the idea that there is a whole bunch of, of research there and it, it, it gets ignored or dismissed. Sure. So, and I don't think that's the main, I think what I described is more interesting than the question of like memory of water and so on, which is itself a fascinating uh, issue, but it, I find that society only talks about that, about homeopathy, and, and doesn't know about everything else. Right? So that's, that's the issue. Okay, so uh, I have a question about your graph at the end where you have an exponential curve uh, going towards spirit. I assume it's you- It's asymptotic. Yeah, asymptotic, yeah. yeah. So I assume you're doing that because of the consciousness of the experimenter introducing spirit into the equation. But in reality, you can make a homeopathic remedy from a machine. So I like to modify that, or propose a modification of that graph not spirit, but information or whatever we want to call yeah, it. Yeah, spirit, energy, information. I mean, and not all the same. They're not all the same. I agree, but that's okay. a discussion. Okay. Yeah, so oh. for sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have.